So the next session is probably um, a perfect continuation of what, um, um, with the help of uh, Mrs. Nicola, um, uh, the initial speakers have, have uh, put up as a framework for the challenges, whether security or feeling secure towards Russia, uh, to address some of the, the, the growing uh, security threats in the region. Um, the panel is called The Future of European Security Perspective, Emerging Strategic Focus or Faltering Ambitions. Um, and uh, the panel, um, and what a rich uh, series of contributions uh, we have today, um, are for the keynote speech, Mr. Alexander Verspau, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, initial commentators, Mihai Razvan Ungurano, Director of the Romanian Foreign Intelligence Service, Mrs. Franz Burwell, uh, Vice President and Director of Transatlantic Relations Atlantic Council. The respondents will be Senatore Benedetto della Vedova, Daniel Leonidza, Levante Banker, Deputy Minister of State for Security Policy of the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Julian Kifu, Director, Center for Conflict Prevention and Early Warning and former um, Foreign Policy Presidential Advisor, and the moderator for this uh, uh, handful of uh, uh, expertise and, and uh, political heavyweights is Radu Tudor, uh, Political and Military Analyst. Thank you. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to be here in Romania and in Bucharest in particular. And uh, this conference and this panel uh, could not be more timely as the future of European security uh, truly does face a perfect storm. For a quarter of a century, Europe has been a place of relative calm after the lifting of the Iron Curtain and the end of Cold War tensions. During that time, our countries have united in friendship on the basis of shared values through organizations like the European Union and NATO. Our economies have flourished and our peoples have forged lasting bonds in ways that were almost considered impossible. And throughout that time, we made a sincere effort to make a democratic Russia an integral part of our Euro-Atlantic community. But today, that benign security environment is threatened. Today, for the first time in NATO's history, we face long-term strategic challenges from two directions. To our east, an increasingly assertive and aggressive Russia, a Russia that rejects Euro-Atlantic values, and seeks to undermine the foundations of the post-Cold War order. And to our south, we face the chaos and violence of failed and failing states and the rise of extremist groups such as ISIL, trends that could lead to the breakdown of the century-old Arab state system. So this is NATO's new strategic reality. But NATO is stepping up to these challenges. Uh, allies are demonstrating that we stand together. During NATO's Wales summit last year, our leaders committed to arresting the decline in our defense budgets and increasing defense spending towards 2% of GDP as our economies grow. Uh, there's still a long way to go, but already there are promising signs with many allies, including Romania, moving in the right direction. This will require a sustained effort and a long-term commitment by all allies, not only to invest more, but to invest in the right capabilities. It requires a fair sharing of the burden of providing assurance measures in the east, at sea, in the air, and on the ground, as well as being prepared to engage in out-of-area operations and missions if they become necessary. Our political commitment and our unity are every bit as important as the adaptation of our defense and deterrence posture. And there have been many significant developments in this area. Uh, the backbone of NATO's military adaptation is the Readiness Action Plan, or the RAP, there has been intense work on the RAP since Wales and with impressive results. Uh, as you know, the key part of our RAP, uh, our Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, or Spearhead Force, is now operational and it's able to deploy within a matter of days. The NATO Response Force is more than doubling to around 40,000 troops, troops that can come to the defense of any ally under threat from the east or the south. We've opened six new command and control and logistics headquarters on the territory of our eastern allies, including one here in Romania, and there are two more on the way. We've significantly increased the size and scope of our exercises to heighten our readiness and provide reassurance and deterrence. But just implementing the Wales decisions is not enough. As we head towards our Warsaw summit next July, we must look to the future and to the long-term adaptation of the Alliance. 
We need to develop a long-term strategy that ensures we can effectively deter any adversary and one that equips us to counter the full range of potential threats and challenges from wherever they may come. Our Warsaw Summit will be an opportunity to take stock of Russia's actions and to assess the future of the NATO-Russia relationship, including what we can do to restore predictability and transparency at a time when Russia seems more interested in shocking, surprising, and intimidating than in calming and build, building confidence. Most importantly, we will need to ask hard questions about what it takes to deter an, an assertive Russia that seeks to go back to the days of spheres of influence when great powers claim the right to change borders by force and to limit the sovereign choices of their neighbors. The RAP is a solid foundation, but to, de to, deter, to effectively deter a revanchist Russia, we will need to go beyond the RAP. We'll need to discuss how NATO can reinforce our Eastern allies in the face of Russian anti-access and area denial tactics. Now, this is especially important in the Baltics and here in the Black Sea region. And indeed, Russia's annexation and militarization of the Crimean Peninsula has changed the game in the Black Sea with long-term strategic implications. We're currently looking closely at what those implications are and how we can mitigate against them. And with Russia's more recent moves to build up military forces in Syria, this is now becoming an issue in the Eastern Mediterranean as well. Ensuring effective deterrence will require an honest assessment of our requirements for the prepositioning of equipment, enablers, and potentially additional forward stationing of combat units on a rotational basis. We also need to further develop our resilience against potential hybrid attacks. This means better sharing of intelligence, identifying potential vulnerabilities, better strategies to defeat cyber attacks, and working more closely with other international organizations, uh, the European Union in particular. Now, having said all this, let me stress that a stronger defense of NATO allies cannot be the whole answer. If we want our alliance to be secure, then our neighborhoods must be stable. And that currently is one thing that they are definitely not. Uh, we need to invest far more in our partnerships to support our neighbors' ability to better defend themselves to contain extremist forces and to bring stability to their regions. They say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and this is very much the case here. We must help our neighbors in the East who are the targets of Russian interference and intimidation so that they can stand their ground and preserve their sovereignty. And we must help our partners in the South to combat extremism, to fight ISIL, and to bring some degree of calm to the explosive atmosphere of the Middle East and North Africa. NATO has many tools which can help in this regard. Our experience with helping nations to reform their security sectors and to build up their defense capacity have the potential to make a huge difference. But for that to happen, we need to invest far more in these programs than we do now. I think this is one of the main challenges for our leaders in the run-up to the Warsaw Summit. And when we're here in Romania, uh, and when we think of helping our partners, we cannot help but think first of Moldova. Through NATO's Defense Capacity Building Initiative, uh, we're helping Moldova with fundamental defense reforms and a strategic assessment of the threats to its national security. This will provide a basis for identifying the capabilities that the Moldovans uh, need to ensure their security within their limited resources. We're also helping Moldova with cybersecurity increasing the transparency and accountability of its defense sector and improving its professional military education and training. Moldova is not seeking NATO membership, but NATO is helping Moldova to chart its own course, to set its own foreign policy, and to provide for its own security. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the world has become a far less stable and secure place remarkably quickly. But NATO has responded remarkably quickly as well. We will continue to adapt our alliance so that it can ensure our collective defense and bolster the stability of our region for the long haul. So I very much look forward to our discussion this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, Mircea, for your very kind um, 
interest into having us here. I'll try to somehow balance what Ambassador Verzbau just said about NATO and speak a bit more about the EU, which among other things should be our primary concern. So therefore, I segmented my brief speech into three parts, one of them addressing the current and future challenges for the European Union, another one addresses what the EU can do and sometimes that does not do, although it has the possibility of doing it, and finally, the good side, the, the lit side of the moon, um, there are some chances into reshaping the actual activity, the actual, the current activity of the European Union. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, while the system of international relations has become more integrated in economic and social terms, it is ever more fragmented politically, dominated by conflicts and insecure. Economic interdependence has outdone national or global governance and has contributed to the flare-up of nationalism. In Europe, economic stagnation, high unemployment among the young and the growing concerns about the wave of migrants or refugees do nothing else but foster the resurgence of the Eurosceptical parties opposing the underpinning principles of the European construction. As a result, while Great Britain will be expressing itself next year about exiting or remaining within the EU, the Scottish nationalism risks leading to a breakaway from the United Kingdom, and furthermore, nationalist feelings are more persistent in Catalonia than anywhere else in Europe. In certain fields, the individual interests of the EU member states prevail in their ties with external partners. In the absence of an EU consensus, nevertheless, the Union's response to the regional instability in the MENA, for example, risks putting more pressure on the EU borders and strain the ties with the states in the southern neighborhood to the other actors' benefits, such as the Russian Federation. Despite being directly affected, affected by the conflict in Syria, especially through the large number of refugees that it needs to handle, the EU failed to respond unitarily. In the absence of a sustained involvement by the EU and the US, Russia acted in force in Syria, while the EU member states preferred individual moves, like Great Britain, who got involved along the US, while France conducted targeted airstrikes on Daesh facilities. Brussels, unfortunately, does not have rapid response instruments for unpredictable situations and often had reactive responses to strategic surprises. In my opinion, in the medium and the long run, the EU will be facing three major geopolitical challenges. The first, Russia's global ambitions in connection with the instability at the EU border. Most states in the EU neighborhood are politically unstable, on the brink of fragmentation or even at the brink of failure. The Arab states are going through problematic political transitions and are facing challenges related to their massive demographic growth, economic stagnation, dwindling resources, or worsening intersectarian cleavages. Furthermore, Russia's current force strategy towards its Western neighbors at the, in the Middle East is an attempt to conceal the structural domestic problems it is facing. Russia's potential economic decline could turn into one of the biggest security challenges for the European Union. Second, China's potential. China is an indispensable partner to the EU, especially in globally relevant is issues such as the liberalization of international trade or climatic changes. This is well known by everybody. Nevertheless, if it comes to the destabilizing potential, an economic crisis in Asia caused by a slowdown in the Chinese economy, or a major security crisis caused by the territorial disputes in East Asia would give the European Union hard problems to solve. Besides the territorial disputes, the negative global repercussions of the Chinese financial sector are relevant considering its scale and especially the stronger economic connectivity and interregional capital transfers. The recent crash of the Shanghai stock market just some months ago strongly highlighted the risk of global financial spillover, causing steep depreciations in the capitals of both Chinese, Asian, Western companies altogether, the effect 
was compared as well known by Western analysts to the 1930s crash. Third challenge, the US role in the international arena. The US will remain the most powerful global political and economic player in the foreseeable future. However, Washington's capacity to ensure the stability of the world order all by itself becomes questionable amid the unprecedented global confrontational climate. As a result, the EU should be prepared, irrespective of the role that the US will take on the international stage, considering, and I underline this, that Europe's security depends on the, European, on the United States. What can the European do? This is the second tire of my speech. Although the combined resources of the EU and the member states make up for an impressive force, among the first ranking economies in the world, earmark the largest amounts for development and come in second insofar as defense expenditures are concerned, the EU does not always act as a global power. The EU is often regarded as a fragmented group in decline, not as a global power. To become a provider of security worldwide, the EU must, firstly, be more united, internally powerful, and very attractive, or in the words of President Juncker, be more sexy. Build powerful alliances regionally and globally, and invest in efficient international institutions. Nevertheless, the EU is the most integrated intergovernmental cooperation format in the world, and has unique capacities that allow it. And I'll just go through them. First, capacities of the European Union. To approach commercial economic relations not only as a source of prosperity, but also as a vector of foreign policy. Commercial agreements closed with various state actors should serve both the strategic and economic interests of the European Union. The access to the European market does not only mean bolstering economic development, but also consolidating other foreign policy goals, such as stability and political reform, in the partner states. Second, to integrate EU's capacity, to integrate the development and assistance policies within the common foreign policy mechanism. The assistance granted to states in a difficult situation and the improvement of governance in these states should be, and underline, should be a foreign policy goal. We should not forget that the EU is among the first donors in the world just two years ago, a couple of years ago, Brussels and the member states spent together 56.5 billion euros for development. A third capacity, to prioritize the goals taking into account the geographic closeness by making clear distinctions between the European neighborhood, quote unquote, and Europe's neighbors, quote unquote, in order to give new impetus to the current neighborhood policy. To this end, I feel like it is necessary to complete the reform processes in the Western Balkans and also to deepen the relations with Turkey, both in its capacity as a EU candidate and strategic partner to the EU. At the same time, I feel that individualizing the bilateral relations with each and every state to the detriment of the so-called package approach can prove more useful for providing real support to the states that are in an advanced transition process, such as Moldova, maybe Ukraine, Morocco, Tunisia, and certainly Georgia. A fourth capacity. EU has the possibility of deepening the transatlantic relation, taking into account two aspects, that the EU and the US should recognize that sometimes their interests might be divergent on, the one, on one hand, and on the other hand, that the EU can be more useful to the US if it is less dependent on its partner. The US will remain the most important part of the European Union. Yet it is necessary that the world order promoted by this duo becomes more permissive by attracting other region or states, especially the like-minded ones. I feel that establishing partnerships with other democracies, such as Australia, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, and promoting regionalism. This is the way the EU may grant expertise and funds to set up 
regional formats similar to the Asian or the African Union. Likewise, the TTIP is not only a free trade agreement, but also the cornerstone of the future transatlantic common market, and at the same time, an impetus for a renewed transatlantic partnership. It is a bond more than a contract. A fifth capacity. The EU has the possibility to convince China and Russia that they should become more responsible actors on the global scene. In the past few years, both states indicated that they want the unilateral cha change of some basic parameters of the current world order. May they be in Southeast Asia or in Eastern Europe. And in order to maintain the world order, the EU can even resort to firmer attitudes in the relation with the two, with the two states. Russia, especially, must be treated as it is. That is unpredictable. Moscow follows a path which is very different from what the EU wants, which does not mean that collaboration with Russia in the international files of interest for the EU, may they be strategic or commercial or anything else, must be stopped, but alternative scenarios should be considered. Furthermore, I feel that the EU should not avoid political confrontation at any cost. It is not in Europe's interest to adjust to the goals of a new imperialist force, and if Russia wants economic interconnection with the EU, it will have to comply with European rules, especially in the energy and financial sectors. A sixth capacity. Europe has the possibility to collaborate more widely with non-state actors, which can decisively contribute to setting global files such as the cybercrime or climate changes. And I think international NGOs should be taken into account as key players in promoting democracy and defending human rights far more flexible, with far more capacities of action than the EU itself. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, to the very, to the very lit side of my conclusion. This June 2015, the European Council tasked the European External Action Service, the EEIS, to prepare by June 2016, quote, an EU global strategy for foreign and security policy, unquote, that would replace the European security strategy adopted in 2003 and then supplemented in 2008, 2009. The renewal of this document has been requested ever since 2009 by, by Finland, Italy, Poland, Spain, Sweden. Some other countries nevertheless have opposed. The future EU strategy will have to define the strategic priorities to set a limited number of goals, to present a vision on the EU role in the world and to establish a series of threats and challenges. That strategy should focus on specific goals. For instance, Rather than mentioning the need to increase investments or expenditures in the military field, it should indicate more specifically the needs in a certain sector, such as increasing the number of multi-purpose aircrafts. At that European Council in June 2015, an assessment of the global security situation was already presented, which represents the starting point of a new strategy. That new document we prepare for next year should not focus only on security issues, but it will have a more comprehensive vision, which in the end should mobilize all the instruments the European Union can have. And I deem this conference should lay a brickstone to that very document. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Nguranu. Thank you for your advice of being more powerful and sexy in the future. It's a very James Bond profile. I hope the Russians will appreciate this. You try. Yes. Uh, next comments come from Francis Barwell, Vice President and Director for Transatlantic Relations at Atlantic Council. Francis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this and including me in this exceptionally interesting panel. Um, I want to make uh, seven points. Um, the first one is extremely brief. 
it is that Europe faces very challenging times. I think everyone here is very well aware of it. What is striking to me as an American who is a frequent visitor to Europe is how much the conversation here has changed. It is so much more about what Europe is going to be able to do together to confront some of the challenges that it faces both to the east and to the south. Um, but it is time to move beyond the conversation and to try and think about actual things that will be done. NATO was a key part, this is my second point, CATO was a key part of that response, and the steps outlined at Wales were a significant step forward. Uh, Ambassador Virschbau has now laid out some other, the progress on the Wales summit, but we are all looking forward to Warsaw. I think his points about the need for a long-term strategy, the need to assess the relationship with the Russians, and the need to build uh, stronger relations with states that may be vulnerable, such as Moldova, uh, are all key. I have to say that, as someone who has been observing NATO for a while, that the activity of the alliance now seems to me more purposeful and more focused than it has since the time of enlargement. And so I guess we can thank the Russians for giving the alliance a much more concrete focus um, but we're looking forward to seeing what will happen in Warsaw. The third, the U.S. is firmly behind this effort. I just want to underscore as the American representative on the panel, even though I'm a think tanker, uh, that the U.S. is very much committed to the defense of its allies, and I do expect that you will continue to see a ramping up of presence in the region, more activities, more high-level visits, I think that this is something that will continue uh, as long as, as we're moving forward. And I do expect a lot uh, to see a lot of American presence coming up to the Warsaw Summit. As a side remark, I also want to underscore the importance of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, as the previous speaker did. This is not just an economic accord, it is a very strategic accord, and in fact, I think that the strategic rationale behind this agreement is what ultimately will make it have to succeed. Uh, there's no doubt that one of the best presents for the Russians would be for us to fail in this, uh, in this agreement. But it's also clear that Europe must do more. Uh, I am not a fan of the 2% arrangement, uh, but there are shortcomings in uh, European capabilities, and we have to find out if it's not the 2% requirement, what is the requirement that will boost uh, those capabilities. Um, I find a very interesting suggestion here about using the June 2016 EU summit, which is a month before the NATO summit, uh, to identify some specific uh, contributions that could be built, some military requirements. Um, and that would also, I think, engage in greater um, EU-NATO coordination, which would be very welcome. Uh, we're also looking forward to seeing what the Eastern Flank Summit may, may produce uh, on the road to Warsaw. But I would also say that particularly here in Romania, there is a real need for a comprehensive reassessment of the Black Sea region and the security requirements that are, uh, that are changing now that that particular area has, has changed. Um, this assessment should do two things. It should examine how uh, both to counter the current Russian assertiveness, but also examine how to build long-term stability in the region. Uh, that is a difficult dilemma. Those are two very different things to try and do, but I think that uh, Romania can and should play a key role in this. It should be not just simply about defense, but economics and energy will play a key role in that as well. Um, it's also true that NATO and the U.S. must do more. And in particular, I would say that we are not engaged in what is now one of the most significant maritime operations on the European coast, and that is the one to the south that is picking up refugees. Uh, EU NAV4 Med, mercifully rechristened Operation Sophia, is now out there. Um, and it's a question for me as to what engagement the U.S. should have and what engagement NATO should have with that. Um, we do have the experience of Operation Atalanta and a NATO operation and a U.S. operation operating off the coast of the Horn of Africa on anti-piracy. 
So I think that there are some lessons from that that perhaps might be relevant as Europe faces one of its greatest crises to the south. Um, let me also add another point that in terms of NATO, some of my colleagues at the Atlantic Council are advocating that we add the concept of resilience uh, to NATO's core tasks of collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. I think this is a very interesting idea. It would involve a greater focus on stability in the immediate neighborhood and helping those governments provide stability and build stability. And in NATO countries themselves, would involve greater cooperation with civilian agencies to uh, assume defense and recovery from cyber and hybrid threats. One of the things that I think NATO does very well is to actually set up checklists, if you will, for countries to go through and see if they are satisfying different criteria. And I think this is an area, the area of resilience, where they could be extremely useful. This will, however, mean more coordination both with the EU and particularly when addressing the immediate neighborhood, some uh, coordination with the EU strategy for its own neighborhood policy. And this brings me to the question put by the organizers. Um, common security and defense policy, is it an emerging strategic focus or a faltering ambition? I have to say that I can't quite make up my mind. Um, as an EU fan and a longtime advocate of the CSDP, uh, which has always had its limits. I do find today a very frustrating time. Uh, EU external relations are generally getting stronger, and I would point to the examples of the Iran sanctions and the Russia sanctions. Uh, but anything that has to do with security and defense has, in my mind over the last few years, suffered from a leadership vacuum, um, and I would say primarily due to British internal politics. So it is good to see so much discussion here in Romania about the need for more CSDP. Um, there are some significant achievements. I mentioned the anti-piracy operation. And we do have Operation Sophia, but I would point out that it's taken ages to reach the level of the Italian mission of Mara Nostrum. Let me uh, just bring up two last points. And I wanted to build on what State Secretary Yanitsa said. We do have the EU, uh, the European Neighborhood Policy Review, and we also have the CSDP review coming up. These two should be coordinated, and yet one can't assume that's going to happen. Uh, but the points that you made, that the ENP review should reinforce the security dimension, and that the partners need to become more resilient, and that the EU needs to coordinate with other stakeholders, including NATO, uh, are all extremely valid, and we should be looking at the European neighborhood policy in conjunction with CSDP. Finally, let me just finish by saying that the U.S. Uh, will remain very much engaged in many of these issues, but we also, as you heard yesterday, will remain engaged in Afghanistan. And as you're all very aware, we have a presidential election underway. Addressing some of the crises in Europe's neighborhood, especially to the south, cannot necessarily wait for us. And I wanted to draw on what the previous speaker said about the EU perhaps being more valuable and useful if it's less dependent and not wanting the US to solve every problem on its own. Um, we will be there. We will be there through NATO. We will be there in Warsaw. We will be there. But we also welcome this activism that I've seen in Romania today and by others to address these, these issues as well. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, we will have uh, right now uh, the view inside the crisis. I will give the floor to Levente Benko, who is the Deputy Minister of State for Security Policy at the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Levente. First of all, let me express my gratitude for this invitation and for the opportunity to speak, uh, uh, to contribute in this, um, to share this panel with uh, distinguished speakers. Um, let me start by saying that um, since 1990, of course, Europe, um, as also the Deputy um, Secretary General pointed out, enjoyed a relative, relative calm. And um, in fact, this has led to a certain, um, certain level of complacency. Um, in, in European countries. Also, in terms of, just to give you one example, 
in terms of cutting our defense budgets. Uh, this tendency um, is being reversed now, but uh, it certainly has been the case um, after, um, uh, after the, the end of the Cold War. Obviously, uh, if we look at the events of the past two years, um, it's, it's easy to contemplate that um, this has been a rude awakening for all of us in the past two years. Europe and the transatlantic community is facing multiple and parallel challenges in Europe. Um, and our immediate neighborhood. Uh, we have been somewhat caught off guard despite some early signals. Um, some of these threats that we, and challenges we are facing are old-fashioned threats in a new disguise, resurfacing in a new disguise, while some other challenges um, are, are new um, in terms of uh, characteristics. Just to name a few. Uh, obviously, the annexation of Crimea and the crisis in Ukraine is posing a direct challenge to the post-Cold War order. Um, it has a serious impact on, European, on the European security architecture, basically questioning its fundaments. Second, uh, the rise of Daesh is a genuine global security threat. It's not only engulfing countries like Syria and Iraq, but it also has offshoots globally. Uh, also in Europe. Third, and not unrelated to the previous one, um, is that Europe is facing an unprecedented migratory crisis that we are trying to cope with as we speak now. And fourth, uh, the new type of challenges that we are facing, we have energy security uh, regularly on our agenda and also cyber security. Um, the significant, significance of both challenges ha have been, uh, has been growing in the past decade, and of course, both energy and cyber are related to the, uh, to the other challenges that I have just enumerated. If I try to respond to the question posed in the title of, the, of this discussion, is there an emerging strategic focus? I would certainly say yes, if we are talking about a NATO framework. Despite uh, the doomsday scenarios that, uh, that I have been speaking about um, so far, uh, I truly believe, um, and in that sense, um, I fully share the point of view um, expressed by Ms. Burval, that uh, NATO has become more purposeful. The way summit has demonstrated that Europe and the transatlantic allies are displaying resilience and responsibility. NATO rediscovered its original collective defense role. The ways commitments to enhance our collective defense capabilities are being implemented in earnest. And if NATO hands out an invitation to Montenegro in December at the upcoming foreign ministerial meeting, it will be not only a demonstration of NATO's open door policy being still um, valid, but also a vivid demonstration of the fact that the Euro-Atlantic integration process in Europe has not stopped and it's still going on. It's, uh, it's a signal, the significance of which I, uh, I cannot overestimate. My country and my government, Hungary, is certainly committed um, in implementing um, the West decisions. Uh, we have started to increase our defense expenditures, uh, 17 per plus 17 percent this year um, as compared to last year. Of course, we are still far away from the 2 percent target, um, uh, designated 2 percent target. We're also going to contribute to the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, and we certainly welcome um, the setup of uh, a forward command and control element, Hungary being one of the two additional countries where such NFIUs are, NFIU is going to set up. Um, all in all, as far as NATO is concerned, I believe that um, NATO has demonstrated that we are ready to improve our defenses without sending the wrong messages. We are not interested in an escalation with Russia. We are certainly looking for a lasting political solution in Ukraine, the bedrock of which must, of course, be um, the implementation, full implementation of the Minsk agreements by all sides. The second, um, second item I wish to talk about, of course, is that we have a global coalition to fight Daesh. This fight is a multi-pronged effort. It has a military, a political development, a communication dimension. 
And let me emphasize that this is not merely a military effort. We must also solidify state structures, restore the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries like Iraq and Syria, with, of course, accommodating the concerns of all the ethnic and religious communities in these countries and build a GAPA system in these countries which is functioning. The Russian intervention in Syria has certainly changed the equation somewhat, but um, we believe that it must be seen as a part of a wider picture. Uh, the Russian intervention is in fact the consequence of four years of war in Syria and the fact that we have been unable to stop this. Um, similarly, the emergence of ISIL Daesh is a direct consequence of this same fact. We still have different interpretations of the regional realities with Russia. However, we must hope that the jointly faced security threats will steer all actors towards identical interpretation. Um, let me emphasize that in our view, no solution in Syria is possible without a dialogue between the transatlantic community and Russia on this issue. As far as my country, Hungary's contribution to the, um, to the global fight against ISIL is concerned, we are proud and uh, committed member of the global coalition. We have a military contribution, contribution in Iraq, training um, uh, Peshmerga, uh, Peshmerga forces um, in Iraq. As far as the European Union is concerned, however, I think that the jury is still out on the question whether there is an emerging focus or not or whether we are talking about faltering ambitions. Let me point out that I believe that much depends on whether the European Union will find the right answers and set the right priorities in handling the ongoing migratory crisis. Certain recent decisions have not been without controversy, in particular the decision about the relocation quotas, and we continue to believe that the permanent relocation and resettlement mechanism is not a remedy to the core issue, it's only a treatment of the consequences. However, yesterday's European Council meeting uh, is received with a cautious optimism in this regard. It uh, adequately highlights the key role of Turkey and the relevance of the cooperation, increased cooperation between the European Union and Turkey in struggling this challenge. And it also highlights the importance of supporting the transit countries with coping with the flow of refugees. And certainly, we must talk about the tackling of the root causes. I already touched upon this point with regard to Syria. But first and foremost, we believe that the number one priority should be to protect our external borders, the external borders of the European Union, and to implement existing EU regulations in this regard. Thank you very much. Attention. I will ask you, Julian Kifu about his opinion on uh, one idea mentioned by the Ambassador Vershbaum. The change of game in the Black Sea, Julian Kifu. And uh, would you refer also please to the justified critics for the EU that were done by Director Ungurian? I think that now and with this I'm, I'm coming to the, the um, complication what happens in the Black Sea is the fact that all our um, institutions, uh, countries' institutions, but also NATO, should move more on a capacity of managing crisis, and I will say multiple crises, because we tend... Thank you, Ambassador Vershwal. He has a very tight schedule, so he has to leave. Thank you. So the, the idea is that we tend to focus always on the last crisis that, that happens and that we have on the table. So we tend also to forget what's happened before. And that was basically coming to, to, to the idea that we have to look very attentively and not forget the fact that we do have an assessment to do on Russia and its perspectives, on the annexation of Crimea, militarization of the region and the new capabilities that change the landscape in the, on the Black Sea. Uh, this together with the conundrum, Syria, Iraq, Middle East, with uh, the new complication that Russia also introduced by uh, its move on, on the Eastern Mediterranean, 
Mediterranean shores and, and these uh, new capacities which are not looking at, uh, at Daesh. On the contrary, the new complication means that it, is re it relaunches the sectarian fight inside the whole Middle East. This Shia-Sunni uh, divide is also relaunched and it, can't, it doesn't help by no means the stop of the migrants coming to Europe. Now, coming to, to the criticism that I think was very well um, uh, drawn by, by Director Ungureanu, you should, avoid, uh, should not avoid confrontations at any costs. I will just quote a, a sequence, and I don't want to, to erase it from the context, which was very well drafted. Well, I think that we have to contemplate the evolution of Europe. Some of uh, our uh, colleagues and partners would say that moving to uh, this type of great power um, address and, and the fact that somebody should take the lead and draw the lines and establish um, the evolution towards a new security and a new stability in our neighborhood is very important. But I think that it is equally important for our solidarity, for our um, balance in, in the whole uh, spectrum. Uh, the idea that uh, the new approach to security, which goes on fle resilience, flexibility, adaptability, to see agility, should not over, um, uh, um, should not ignore the cooperation, the inclusiveness, and the shared decision, uh, especially in this uh, this type of approach of multiple crisis uh, spectrum. First of all, because I, 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 I had a lot of meetings with uh, colleagues of mine all over the European Union, state, member states, saying at the beginning that this is a very, uh, this is a wonderful, this is a very strong push factor. If you save lives, more will come. Then when you see a, a lot of people coming by from Turkey and so on, probably Everybody understood that was a duty for a European Union member state, first of all, save li lives of children and women and, and so on. So thanks a lot. Uh, just a, <clears throat> the parallel unfolding of the Ukrainian crisis and conflicts in North Africa and the Middle East has worsened highlighted uh, Europe's inability to respond due to divergent takes among member states and what to do to do first and how. This unusually daunting set of circumstances, however, unleashed a beneficial exercise of soul searching among European partners, which I'm confident will soon deliver a more effective EU foreign policy and security strategy based on the proposal that the High Representative Vice President Mogherini will spell out for our leaders at the European Council of June 2016. What should be the key elements of this, this strategy th uh, 13 years after the previous one was released? We should early clearly state, start by assessing the validity of three core objectives that have shaped the perimeter of the EU action abroad. Neighborhood, relationship with so-called strategic partners, and crisis management. And I do believe that the EU is emerging from the present crisis with a more focused, ambitious, and achievable security perspective. Because this is what the EU does best turns challenges into opportunities for self-improvement. And I think that what happened in uh, the Ukrainian crisis uh, was important. I know perfectly that we in Italy and you in Romania, for instance, have different perspectives from, for historical and geographical reasons. But to maintain the unity inside EU among sanctions, uh, for instance, was a big achievement. We, in our public opinion, had to tackle uh, 
uh, a rise in criticism against sanctions, for instance. But my government and my prime ministers reaffirm every time that we stand where the EU stands about uh, sanctions, for instance. So, uh, I, I, but we know perfectly at the same time that the, the key issue in Ukrainian crisis is to prevent Ukraine and it, Ukraine itself to go worse and not to go better about security, domestic security and domestic economy. And our first aim, after sanctions of course, is to help Ukraine to go back on uh, the, 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 the good track about economic recovery. Because this is, must be not on the security field, but on the cooperation field must be high on the agenda to help and to focus in, to monitoring the uh, economic recovery in Ukraine. Otherwise, we will have big problems in the future and otherwise, uh, Mr. Putin will say so, that they joined the they joined EU and it's a disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benedetto. I will ask Daniel Nitsa. What is his answer about uh, Romania being mentioned in every speech of our colleagues here in the panel? And uh, lots of expectations for our country when you talk about European security and the changing game in the Black Sea. Well, of course, uh, allow me actually uh, to, 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 to go brief to, to this because I think there are some uh, important lessons for each and every of us and uh, I'll try actually to take seriously my, my role uh, as respondent actually to that. And uh, I've noticed the fact that actually uh, Ambassador Vejbo uh, spoke about uh, spoke about the works of uh, NATO and uh, he, he pointed out uh, the need of uh, implementation of the decisions taken uh, at the Wales, but also he spoke about the adaptation process to which NATO is facing uh, for, for, for the next summit in, in Warsaw. Uh, and of course, uh, the elephant in the room is represented by our response to, 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 to Russia. Uh, Director Unguranu referred uh, to the challenges to which we are facing. Uh, today, and he presented uh, the EU uh, major political challenges, and he tried also to point out so, to also to some solutions. Uh, I've noticed also the fact, actually, uh, as a value added to that, uh, uh, Levente insisted on the fight, uh, on the uh, our cooperation for fighting against the Daesh, and uh, Francis to the. Romania's uh, contribution to the wider Black Sea area. Uh, at the same time, all the speakers uh, mentioned Romania, and all the speakers were somehow uh, on the same page when it comes to, I would say, four strategic dimensions, uh, which I do believe are vital uh, for any sustainable, sustainable solution to challenges we're facing uh, with. The first one is the transatlantic bond which is essential to approach the currently challenges uh, in a very successful manner. Uh, a united and cohesive, cohesive uh, Euro-Atlantic community will be able to diffuse threats, foster dialogue, and project stability. Second, uh, in response to an evolving, unpredictable uh, security environment, we need in, uh, to increase our focus on and resources to collective defense. Uh, all speakers mentioned the necessity of uh, uh, reaching the level of 2% of uh, our GDP for, 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 for defense, and I think this is the new uh, rule in town. Uh, and of course, uh, Romania is trying actually to do its uh, utmost uh, in this respect. The third uh, dimension is the cooperation and the coordination, uh, which uh, are the main criteria that that measures the success or the failure of international involvement in any troubled security landscape. And this uh, 
cooperation and uh, coordination, I think, is valid when we're speaking about Ukraine or if we're speaking about the situation in Syria or if we're speaking about uh, our necessity to deal with uh, uh, any crisis in and around Romania. Uh, in this regard, uh, it's my strong belief that uh, achieving the full potential of the NATO-European Union cooperation would be a prerequisite to the value added, especially in answering to the common challenges uh, both organizations uh, are, are facing with. Uh, at the same time, as both organizations uh, have the same neighborhood to deal with, uh, common approaches in NATO and EU, uh, we do have the same uh, challenges and the same responsibilities uh, on Ukraine, on the Republic of Moldova, on Georgia, and also to the challenges which are emanating from North Africa and Middle East. Uh, and I think our cooperation and coordination are a must if we want to efficiently cope with these uh, challenges. At the same time, uh, s the several speakers referred to the uh, new security challenges pertaining uh, especially to energy security, uh, cyber defense, maritime security, uh, terrorism, uh, which of course are going to do our agenda. Our agenda, I mean also Romania's agenda. Uh, and the fourth dimension, uh, I, I, I think that security cannot be done without our partners. In order to project peace and uh, stability, we need to think more to our partners, uh, in both in the East and also in the South. Uh, NATO launched uh, initiatives to help them cope better with the existing security challenges, but we have uh, we have no overarching strategy. That is why we see the need of a NATO strategic framework for the neighborhood, which should apply to both East and South. In other words, we need one strategy with two legs, East and South. Uh, I, I will stop here, and uh, I would thank you so much, actually. For thank you, Daniel. Questions, comments, please mention your name and to whom you address. Hello, uh, Ambassador of Turkey, Koray Artaş. Thank you for uh, all this long session and remarks. Um, we are passing through testing times indeed. All of us uh, is experiencing serious challenges. Of course, there are visible and concrete reasons. Um, a bolder Russia, a huge conflict in Syria, increasing refugee crisis, and etc. But there is another thing uh, which is so important in this overall crisis. It is actually mentioned uh, by uh, some of the commentators here. It is the lack of leadership uh, on uh, our own alliance. Uh, when we talk about leadership, uh, it comes two things in mind, the US and the EU as a whole. And when we talk about the EU, we generally talk about the soft power, the tremendous soft power uh, of this union. Um, remember the years 2000s, uh, the enlargement instrument itself was a great power to transform many countries, and we have many examples. Um, it was also the case in my own country as well. The transformation that Turkey um, witnessed through 2000s um, was marked by the strong anchor uh, that was encouraged uh, by the EU itself. Uh, in today's remarks, uh, of course, we uh, mentioned uh, about uh, Turkey's role in refugee crisis and etc., which is inevitable. Uh, but when it comes to the enlargement, uh, I believe uh, we have to be, of course, we have to take care of the ideas of our own constituencies. Uh, there is the reality of politics, uh, but we should also have in mind that we have to use this tool as well. Uh, we should not uh, feel ourselves necess necessarily to say, well, in five years later, we'll take these countries in, but at least we have to keep this anchor. Uh, at least to use the strong uh, soft power uh, of the EU. Since in the panel we have uh, three representatives of our uh, friendly, if I may say, because when I say friendly, uh, in terms of looking uh, positively to Turkey's membership, uh, I, I took the liberty uh, to pose the question. When it comes to the enlargement, um, I believe uh, encouraging words is so much important during these testing times. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, one short question about the correlation between ENP and CSDP review uh, and assessment uh, correlation. Um, Russians have always brought into discussion the fact that the successive uh, waves of NATO enlargement 
um, have uh, been the, the, the major uh, issue of concern for them. Uh, then, when the ENP was launched in 2008, at the beginning, they seemed to be fine with the idea, uh, with the focus on the economic and social and governance uh, transformation of the um, Eastern partners. But um, as these states, as Eastern partners um, became to progress, um, of course, Moscow started to, to become more, more wary of the real objectives of ENP. Uh, what would be the policy alternative for these states, for countries like the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine, um, if not membership, naturally? Uh, thank you. And the question would be for Ms. Uh, Mrs. Burwell and our Hungarian guest. Thank you. So let me put that caveat out there first. Um, I do think that your observation is correct, that the Russians at first were very uh, blasé about ENP. Uh, and about particularly the Eastern Partnership, but I think that they have woken up to what is really the soft power and the economic power of the EU after misunderstanding the EU for quite a long time. Uh, so I do think that these countries are going to face increased pressure, and so I think it is incumbent upon us, and by us I mean the United States and Europe, uh, but Europe is the proximity power, if I can put it that way, uh, to, uh, to make these countries more resilient in many ways, not just the defense ways, the defense ways, the military ways that uh, Ambassador Verschbau mentioned. Uh, I think we ought to be talking about, if we get a TTIP, which I'm determined and hopeful that we will, what will be the relationship of these countries to such a bilateral US-EU trade agreement. Since most of them, uh, and in fact the three, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, have deep and comprehensive free trade agreements with the EU, with Ukraine scheduled to go into effect in 2016. So we should be having conversations along those levels. And then those countries will have to eventually decide whether they want to be members of the EU and undertake the very extensive responsibilities and obligations that come with that choice. Thank you very much for your question. I fully share your analysis on, on the Eastern Partnership and let me also refer back to the remarks made by uh, His Excellency the Ambassador of Turkey in this regard. Um, the soft power status of the EU and the messages that the European Union is sending out to these partners uh, is, is, is of extreme importance. Uh, it's, it's also important in the case of candidate countries, but it's probably even more so in the case of the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, which are in this sort of gray zone between the European Union uh, uh, and Russia. Unfortunately, um, the, um, the issue of a members, membership perspective for the Eastern Partnership countries is a divisive issue in the, in the EU. Uh, there is no consensus about it and some member states are strongly opposed to the idea. Therefore, we have a typical EU compromise uh, as an agreed language about what kind of future the EU can offer for, the, for, for these countries. Uh, I can tell you that um, uh, in, in, in our country's case, we're fully behind um, uh, state, stating the fact uh, in the case of these countries that these are European countries, and as such, under the treaty, uh, treaties, they are eligible for membership. That is our interpretation um, of, of the geographical and, 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 and the legal situation. But nevertheless, um, it's, it's a genuine problem that we are, we, the European Union uh, as a whole, is not able to, uh, uh, to, to, to formulate a unified and unequivocal uh, message in this regard. On the other hand, um, uh, let me also point out that, of course, the partners themselves must make their part uh, of, of the duties and, and implement those reforms which are enshrined in the association agreement and the deep and compressing free trade agreement because that's the best way to, to persuade uh, the European Union member states that uh, it is time uh, to, 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 to offer trust um, uh, and, and to accelerate the, the, the integration uh, process in, in this regard. Uh, um, on, on this point, I think that the partner countries still have um, 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 a lot to do. So this is, this is a two-way street um, in, in this sense. Thank you.
Thank you, Levante. Okay, so this is it. I want to thank everybody for uh, this panel. It was successful from my point of view with open and important ideas. Thank you, everybody.